you know? Yeah. Yeah, right, right. How odd, yeah. And that's the other thing. Uh, uh, I think the other lesson that, that, that squirrels teach us is like, you know, if you were to see a rat, you'd be like, ooh, get away, you know, probably. But you see a squirrel, and it's like, oh, look, look how cute the squirrel is, which I guess shows that it pays to accessorize, you know. You get that fluffy tail going, and, and all of a sudden you're lovable, even though you're essentially the same thing, you yeah. um, For some reason, my kids like mice and, and rats. My one daughter has a mouse, and my other daughter says she wants to get a pet rat, so... I don't know what that was. I mean, growing up for me, like, mice, mice and rats were like, you know, you didn't want to see them. You, you didn't, you know. My, my mom even objected to them depicting mice as cute in cartoons. Like in Tom and Jerry, it's like, mice aren't cute. I don't know why they're showing a mouse like that. You know? And I think she was secretly rooting for Jerry throughout the whole thing. We're going to continue on our discussion of accessibility but first, I had a, a, a question from a student about putting videos on a page. And I want to show just a couple of things um, and talk about sort of the old way to do it and talk about the new way to do it. Um, you can fairly easily see how to put uh, a video on a page simply by going to YouTube and, and checking out the embed command. All right. So... If we go to YouTube and look up some videos, I want to test this out. I'm going to type in database design because I know I have a popular database design video. Let's see if it finds it. Nope. Oh, yes it is. Yeah, there we go. Yay. This one has gotten a lot of views. 13,000 views, 28 likes, right. one dislike. <clears throat> Last one time person we... doesn't like it, you know? And, and, and this, is, this is me growing up. It's, it's like, you know, instead of saying, wow, 28 people liked it, it's like, what is, you know, what did I do wrong, you know, that that one person doesn't like it, you know? But anyhow, if you click share and embed, you'll see it will give you a little snippet of code here that you can actually just copy and paste and put on your page. Now, videos in HTML4 and prior, there were all sorts of irregularities. There were browser issues and plugin issues and all sorts of things like that. One of the aims of HTML5 is to simplify that a, a lot. So this is sort of the old, old style uh, code. Let's do a quick Google and look at HTML5 video, and we'll see, hopefully, it is a little easier. Show video in HTML5, this is all you need. Video. And so on. Now, let me make that bigger. It's almost like an image tag, except instead of a image tag, it's a video tag. The one difference is, is you actually have multiple sources available. Which means that depending on what kind of computer you have and, and, and all that and, your, and, and depending on what your browser can handle, it will look down and it will play the first video that it can. If it can't play any of the videos, you get that message saying your browser doesn't support the video tag. So for example, if you had an earlier version of Internet Explorer or a real old version of Firefox or whatever. All right. So that's really all you need to do. Uh, the source would be just like doing a source for an image. So if there was uh, folders, you would put in the folders in the path. Yes? So you would have to save your video. You wouldn't have to, but you could. If you wanted to. If you wanted to, yeah. Yeah. 
So, and, and typically that's easy. You know, once you create a video using some sort of software uh, per, that, that stores it in some sort of proprietary format that allows you to work with it and edit it and, and et cetera, and then you export it into a, a format that people can consume. So, MP4, OGG, Windows Media, yeah. You just go save as or export, depending on, on the specific software that, that you're talking about. So, and that in a nutshell is what all you need to do to embed a video. All right, we were talking about accessibility. And let's, let's summarize where, where we are and, let, and let's, you know, sort of chart out the path going ahead. Uh, one thing we said about accessibility is, all right, The first principle that we talked about is we talked about a principle and we didn't, I don't think we call it by this name, but I'm going to call it by this name now. And it's the principle of universal design. And universal design sort of thinks beyond the, well, I'm going to develop things for disabled people. It thinks of what I can do to benefit everyone. All right, it's a more inclusive sort of approach. Because we made the observation that things, accommodations, accommodations, I hope that's spelled right, accommodations, yeah. Accommodations that we make for people that are disabled can also benefit people that are not disabled under certain circumstances. So, for example, um, Accommodations we make for people that can't hear, like a transcript of the audio, can benefit people that are in an environment that doesn't lend itself to listening. For example, the lab environment, or if, if people want to skim through the text of an article quickly, and so on. So we can say it, that we're doing that for people that, that can't hear, but we're also benefiting other people as well. So in a way, it's just, it's just good design. Um, so the notion of universal design is that the, accommod the, the, the accommodations can typically benefit all, at least under some circumstances. And if they don't actually benefit people, it won't get in the way. You know, the elevator over there, you know, that, that you could take up. Someone in a wheelchair, that would be of, of benefit to them. All right? That could be of benefit to me if I like were wheeling a cart around. If I was taking a cart with some of my multimedia equipment and needed to come down here, it would benefit me. But you know what? If none of those things apply, it doesn't particularly get in my way the fact that there's an elevator over there. I can take the steps and not worry about it. All right? So that's the one sort of guiding principle of universal design. All right? Now we talked about a number of disabilities last time. And I want to kind of summarize those and see if we missed a few. I think we had pretty good coverage, but um, I wanted to, you know, fill any gaps and just review these. We talked about, in terms of disabilities, we talked about vision-related. All right? This can be people that are blind, that access the site using a screen reader where the screen reader actually reads the text to the person. But it can also include people who just have weak vision. People that are colorblind. And so on. We'll notice that almost any of these disabilities, they're sort of the very strong example of that. Then there's also other, you know, slightly less debilitating forms of it, you know. I'm not blind, but I don't have good eyesight, all right? So, yeah, I, I you know, I, I may not use a screen reader to access the page, but still, vision's an issue, or it can be an issue if it's not designed correctly. Hearing. Again, people that are deaf, people that have weak hearing, and people whose circumstances, whether they're in a noisy lab 
or they're in a hurry and they don't want to listen to a, a video clip or whatever prevents them from being able to access audio content. We talked about motor control. And we talked about in extreme cases, paralysis. Someone's paralyzed, how could they do anything on a computer? Yeah, well, yeah, in very extreme cases, you have Stephen Hawking that uses his mouth to control a pointer on the screen. What's another way that, that, that someone that, that did not have use of their arms could interact with the computer? A voice recognition. Right, you give voice commands. Um, that's becoming, again, you know, w that, that's been around for a, lo for a long time, and, and it, it continues to get better and better. You know, most phones have that sort of thing, and occasionally hiccups, but um, if you limit the number of potential responses, that's one thing that really helps with voice recognition. And again, over time, you can actually train to, to, to hear you, which is, which is another thing. You know, if you think about it, um, you know, that, that's why those, a lot of those telephone systems, you know, they don't tell you just like, they don't let you just like ramble on about what your problem is, right? Because that would be very hard to like figure out what you're trying to say. They say to talk to uh, technical support, say, you know, say one. To talk to sales, say two, and so on. Well, if it's limited to three or four responses, it's a lot easier to, to, to have voice recognition software recognize one versus two than like, well, you see, this is what's going on today. I'm trying to access the internet and blah, 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 you know, that kind of thing. All right. So besides paralysis, you have a whole range of things that in, in, involve certain neurological issues where, again, the person isn't paralyzed but they don't necessarily have the fine degree of control. I had a student in, in one of my classes a, a bunch of years back that was in a wheelchair, and really they, they could move their arms, but they really didn't have like the fine control to go and point a mouse or, or to type on a keyboard. Um, they, uh, a, another thing that would be this would be something like carpal tunnel and arthritis. All right. Probably the last area that we didn't talk about is different cognitive disabilities. That would be things like ADD, things like dyslexia, and so on. All right? And these are things that can affect someone's experience accessing the web. All right? Here's what I want to do. I want to talk about two... I want to talk about a couple things about accessibility, then let's go through and find some examples for each of these different folks. For one thing, I think we can see that when I started this discussion, I said that one thing accessibility wasn't was simply developing websites for blind people. And that, that's what a lot of people have the impression that it is. All right. Um, however, uh, we see that when you include all the disabilities that are relevant, and when you consider that there are sort of the, the full form of that disability, and then there's milder versions of that disability that can impact someone's ability to access the web, then you'll see the, the, the net goes out a lot wider and, and more people are, are covered under this. The two key principles in accessible websites, and again, these are not in conflict with just our basic web design principles, but the two big things about uh, web design uh, for accessibility are simplicity and multiple presentations. Simplicity we should, we should be familiar with. You know, it's, it's obvious what we mean by simple. In some respects, it's obvious. You know, we talked about this, not having too much clutter on a page. Having a consistent layout. That's a form of simplicity, where you don't have your pages look totally different each time. You know, on each page looks a little different than the others. But your links are consistent, and the text is meaningful, and it makes sense. And you've organized your content 
in a way that makes sense. You don't have distracting things going on, all right? Like, for example, little animated pictures of a frog jumping up and down that don't serve any purpose but could distract someone that has ADD. Uh, and in fact, some of those uh, animations can actually uh, trigger seizures potentially in, in even more extreme cases. So simplicity we kind of, I think, have a, 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 an idea for. What do I mean by multiple presentations? Yes. Yeah. In other words, using more than one type of sensory method, one type of media, to, um, to express an idea. For example, text and an image. All right? That would help a number of people with disabilities, right? It would help someone that can't see very well, right? Because they can't see the image, perhaps, but their screen reader can read the text to them. So that's one uh, one help. It would help someone that is dyslexic because the picture might help them interpret the text that they read. Again, there's a lot of misunderstanding about dyslexia. You know, people think it's, oh, you see the words backwards or whatever. It's not. There, there, there's a, a variety of different forms of it, and it can, it can include, you know, simply switching two letters in your head. For example, if it's a lowercase d, seeing that instead, seeing a lowercase b instead, or whatever. Well, one of the things that an image can do is give a context and, and let the person know, okay, this is what this page is about, and that may help that person interpret the text. All right? Um, so that's a case of multiple presentation. Now, you might say, am I talking out of both sides of my mouth here? Right? Uh, I, I, am I still in election mode and um, saying two totally opposite things? In one respect, we want things to be simple. In another thing, we're saying show the same thing a couple different ways. That doesn't sound like simple to me. Well, it's about making choices and about picking and choosing and putting things on the page that add value. All right? One thing about accessible design is, again, and one thing even about simplicity, is that doesn't mean you strip everything down to the bare bones. You can have multimedia, you can have audio, you can have video, you can have images, but do it with purpose. Do it purposefully and make sure the stuff that you do put on your page truly adds value. And one value that it can add, again, is to help people with disabilities if they can't get one presentation, they get the other. All right? So, go ahead. Is there any for asking the uh, for, for a choice? Pick up the telephone. Uh -huh. It'll say uh, press number or, or press number two for the stand. If you have any questions, so on. Is there, is there any disdain for asking the viewer and if they hit the web page? Okay. The question is, is, is there any issue with, um, like, asking the user, for example, are you on a mobile device or on a desktop device? Uh, do you have issues with, with hearing? Do you have issues with, with this, that, or the other? And I'm going to answer that question, again, in a long, roundabout way, right? Because that's what we do for a living, right? You know, we, we're, not gonna, we're not just going to give you an answer. We're going we're gonna to give you a story first. Um, I, I've heard this said. Uh, um, how do you know an umpire in baseball is doing a good job? When you don't notice that the umpire is there, right? That you're just watching the game, you're enjoying it, everything's running smoothly, you know, the strikes are called strikes, the balls are called balls, they're called safe, they're out correctly, and you don't even notice the umpires there. They're, they're there, of course, and they're, you know, running the game and all that, but you don't notice they're there. I guess I would say design is a lot like that, all right? That design is subtle and is such that 
These things are done, but not in a heavy-handed way, whereas you would have to ask, like, do you, are you on a mobile? You could write software to detect that, right? So your design can go and detect that and decide, hey, this person, I can look and say, hey, this person's coming in on a phone, this person's on a computer, and I can accommodate the page uh, uh, directly. The other thing is, like, I wouldn't put on a site, um, you know, if you have issues with hearing, click here and then display text instead of audio. I would design the pages such that there'd be audio and there'd be text, and anyone that would want to would just naturally, gee, if you had issues hearing, you'd just go and read the text. If you wanted to hear the spoken words, then you'd go and play the audio. All right? So I guess what I was saying is, is my idea of good design would be where it would not be sort of that heavy-handed where it would just be, it would just work, and it would just be there and stuff available to the user so that they could pick and choose what they want, all right? Especially when you keep in mind, again, that not all these accommodations, or how do I want to rephrase this? These accommodations, many of them, also benefit people that don't have that disability. So, for example, I may not be hard of hearing, but I may not want to sit through a video. I might want to scan through the text. Whereas if it's presented in a straightforward way, all right, then you can avoid that sort of thing. Again, it's really, in a way, balancing these two and making decisions, all right? All design is about making decisions. What, 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 you know, what you're going to put in, what you're going to take out, all right? And there's nothing wrong with having the same content presented multiple different ways, provided you do it in a straightforward, simple way, and provided the stuff that you do adds value. Now, let me give you a for instance of overkill, okay? <laughs> Let's say you wanted to show, you wanted to explain a process, how to use a, a, a French coffee press, okay? You might say to yourself, well, gee, Zeller said multiple presentations, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to have a video explaining how to use uh, uh, a, a French coffee press. I'm then going to have, because some people can't, because some people can't see and can't see the video, I'm going to have an audio track that explains step by step what to do in great detail. And then there might be some people that might get a kick out of seeing an animation of it instead. All right. And then there might be someone that wants to see, like, a set of pictures so that they can sit and stare at those pictures. And then there might be someone that simply wants to read a description. So here I'm going to go and I'm going to put on my page on how to use a French coffee press. I'm going to have a video, an audio, an animation, a series of images, and text. That's a case of overkill. You might say, well, but multiple presentations. There might be someone that would benefit. Yeah, but... Part of your job is making everything that you have in there count. So it's not a matter of stripping things down to the bone all the time. It's a matter of the stuff that you add in, make sure it counts. You know, in a case like that, I guess I would say probably the video and the audio would be redundant, right? Probably the animation in the video would be redundant, you know. Um, maybe even the photo gallery and and the video would be redundant. So pick a couple of them if you want, but don't pick all of them, you know. Um, the, the, the fashion designer, Coco Chanel, uh, said something to the effect that when a lady goes out for a, a night on the town, you know, and this is again, you know, going to someplace glamorous, you know, they should look in the mirror and, and take off one accessory. So if they have a necklace on, take off the earrings. If they have uh, a brooch and a bracelet and that, you know, and, and uh, I don't know, a tiara, <laughs> take one of them off, all right? Because the idea is, you know, there's a sense that less is more. Now, in web design, remember that everything that you put on the page has the potential to distract from anything else that's there, right? So if you beat over the head, beat, beats, beat a concept to death with 
five different ways of presenting something. You're not adding any value and you might be confusing the user. Instead, pick a couple. Pick the ones that you think are going to have the most impact. All right? And therefore, don't distract people from that. So, balancing between these two things, the simplicity and multiple presentation, to a large degree, um, is a lot of what accessibility is. And if you think about it, it's a lot of just what plain good web design is. There are some very specific <coughs> techniques, though. And we'll talk about some of them today. And as we go on for the rest of the semester, we'll talk about some more of them as well. One thing that I didn't talk about that I'd like to is really accessibility has two parts to it. I'm focusing on the universal design aspect of it because that's the thing that we can control. We as a web de uh, designer can control. But there's also all sorts of assistive technology. Assistive technology. And I've alluded to some of this, but I'd like to show some of the assistive technology that's available. Keeping in mind that this is just a Windows XP machine, not particularly built with accessibility in mind. If you were someone that had certain disabilities, you would get special software and special hardware that would help things. There's actually things of braille display where the, the, the text can come across on braille so it can be read that way and so on. But some of these things are built right in the windows. Let's go under Windows um, Accessibility Options, under Accessories, Accessibility. And there's a wizard. One thing that you can have is a screen magnifier. Whereas if you're having trouble reading something, you can put that in and you get that window on the top to sort of see in more detail. And you make that bigger, yeah. So that's one thing that can be done. And again, this is true of all of the things built into the operating system, intended to provide a minimum level of functionality. Most users with visual impair impairments will need to, 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 to use something more extensive than this. But this will give you an idea. When I talk about assistive technology, I'm talking both about hardware and software stuff um, that can be done. I can invert colors if, if I have difficulty color blinding, uh, with color blindness, and so on. Next thing I want to look at here is, and I hope this works with the audio, is the screen narrator. Foreground window, Microsoft narrator. Okay, push here. button to press, use space bar. Microsoft Narrator, Dialogue. Narrator is a text-to-speech program that can help people with low vision set up their own computers or use other people's computers. Narrator might not perform well with some programs and only speaks in English. Most users with visual impairments will need a screen reader with higher functionality for daily use. For a list of Windows-based screen readers, see the Microsoft website. To add narrator, but repeat this or any text. Press Control plus Shift plus S B C A B A R. Do not show this message again. Checkbox. Okay. Push button. Okay. Uh, and there again, even they're telling you that that this is not necessarily going to solve all the problems of some of this visual impaired. This is a low feature, low functionality, but. The fact that it's building the operating system is nice because you know that if you go to any machine, let's say you were using a friend's machine or a machine in the lab and it wasn't, didn't have the proper software installed, at least you could get this. Now let's bring up a web page. Pop-up start. Pop-up menu, foreground window. W window. Customize your settings, pane, red only. Address, editable tab, oh, I, I, S, S, P, U, enter. 
http colon slash window Lorraine County Community College home pain read only as I tab around it tab address editable text http colon slash slash www.lorraine.edu slash tab page control toolbar refresh f push button to press use space bar tool tip tab Live search, editable text, tab, search control, toolbar, tab, favorites command bar, to tab, Lorraine County Community College home, tab, command bar, toolbar, home, tab, Lorraine County Community College home, pane, read only, editable text, tab, push button, to press, use space bar, tab, contact us, link, Tab, site map, link. Tab, my computer login, link. Tab, link. Tab, link. Notice we're saying tab link, tab link. Whoever did this development kind of missed the boat on that because it should be giving them descriptive text. Now, um, foreground wind, foreground usually, wind. Usually when, foreground um, wind. all right, be quiet now. <laughs> Usually when I demonstrate that, people are like, how can anyone do anything with that, right? You know, it, 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 it seems to be just, you know, incredibly difficult to do anything with that. Um, well, you do what you have to do, right? How do people, th th there was a guy uh, that used to work in this building for the vending company that was blind that used to come and fill the soda machines, you know? I can't imagine doing that without being able to see, you know? But he did it, right? Uh, when you're faced with circumstances, you do what you need to do. And if that was the only way to access the web, you would figure out a way to make it work, all right? I did a summer fellowship at NASA, and there was, uh, I shared an office with a high school student that was blind, and she had a blind mentor uh, at, at, uh, uh, that was an engineer at NASA. And every day I would come in, and many days the, I would come in and the room would be dark. All right? And she would be sitting there working on the computer with the monitor shut off, right? Because she doesn't need the monitor on, you know? And through the use of that assistive technology, she was able to do pretty much what she needed to do. Now, Provided, of course, that people put in those hooks and do things for accessible technology. For example, don't have links that are named link. All right? Don't have links that are named click here. All right? Be descriptive about that, and that could help out. It was, you know, every maybe once a week, or maybe even less often than that, she'd call me over and say, what's on my screen now? You know, because for whatever reason, the screen reader would get confused and whatever, and I'd have to help her out of a jam. But for the most part, she did everything that you'd expect a high school kid to do uh, on the computer, including probably goofing off at her job and, and sometimes chatting with her friends on IM. All right? um, but again, it was impressive uh, to see that w with that. Um, so again, there's assistive technology that folks use that, that have that. I guess the last one, there's an on-screen keyboard that is easier for some people to navigate than actually typing. The person I mentioned that was in a wheelchair in my classes um, typically used the on-screen keyboard instead of typing stuff by hand. Um, but again, the, the, the bad truth of the matter is that if you don't apply these universal design techniques, you can make the assistive technology useless. All right? Now, let's go through and let's think of things that we can do as a web designer for people that have these different disabilities. We'll go through these, and again, we'll come back as we go on through the semester to some other specific things, but let's go through some of these disabilities and talk about the things that we can do, and possibly discuss the impact on people that can see, or, well, can see or can hear or whatever. All right, first one, people have vision issues. What are some things that we can do to help people that have issues with their vision, whether they be blind or just don't have great eyesight? Yes? Stuff that you, you bring, let me add an image with the 
Okay. Alt attribute on an image. That's definitely one thing. Yes. Okay. And that's a big one. All right. Yeah, that, that's what the screen reader, JAWS, which is a popular screen reader, or other screen readers would read instead of, you know, because a person can't see the image. Right, so you can supply that. You can actually even put an extended description in, which would be a link to another web page that would have maybe more detail about it if that wasn't adequate. What's other things we can do for people with? What's, what's that? Okay. That's one thing. That, that's additional stuff that you can put in to sort of tip off the assistive technologies. Now, these kinds of things don't particularly benefit people that can see. Like alternate text and, and, and the ARIA uh, role tags don't really do that. But you know what? They don't get in the way either. All right? Yes. Uh, yeah, nice contrasting colors. In other words, you know, no yellow text on an orange background, you know. Uh, Pick, you know, pick colors that have a high contrast because that's the most readable. Yes? Mm -hmm. All right. 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 Exactly. Have, have a page designed so it's not cluttered. All right, and there's not too much stuff on the page. There's a right, right amount of stuff on the page. Not too much, not too little. There's white space between the stuff. That would help people that um, maybe can see partly uh, to, to see the content. Having appropriate colors, having appropriate font size. Now, if you think about this, all this stuff is really just like, well, yeah, you know. Let's imagine you have eagle eyes, right, and you can see better than 2020. Are you going to say, you know what, I have great eyesight. I don't want to see black text on a, on a white background. I want to really show off my great eyesight. So give me tiny little font in yellow on an orange background. No, of course not. You know? Who wants to make it hard, even if they don't have this disability? So in some respects, some of this stuff is just common sense. All right? But, you know, as... as a number of people have observed common sense isn't always all that common, right? So it does, does bear to, to go over those. So things about the size and the, the white space on the page and all that are important. What about for colorblind people? What are some things that we can do for colorblind people? Someone want to extend that? You, you said uh, don't make a link blue because they might not be able to to see that if they're blue green colorblind. Yeah, yeah. Don't make them only color based. So, for example, blue and underlined for links. All right. Uh, someone that is colorblind may not be able to distinguish the different color, but they will be able to distinguish that is underlined. All right. So kind of the way to summarize this is that don't only use color to indicate something special. Use color plus something else. Use color plus a different font or a different size or bold or underlined. All right. But do those things together. All right. Um, and that way someone that's colorblind, they'll get the cue. Right? They'll get the visual cue. Someone that's not colorblind, they'll just get two cues. All right? They'll see it's blue and underlined, and that will tell them it's a link. All right? Contrasting colors also, also help as well. All right. Right. Yeah. Uh, possibly a mouse over effect can help people specifically for links or buttons to see, even if they can't distinguish the color. That would be, that would be a good technique. Hearing. We sort of talked about the accommodations for hearing, and, and we said that, um, you know, having um, essentially transcripts 
or having a second way to present the material other than audio would be beneficial. What about people with motor control issues? What can we do for them? Yeah, don't make tiny little areas that you have to point to and click. All right. Yeah, maybe clickable buttons instead of text links would be another good potential one. Some of these things, again, are important too when you think of, of making a mobile version of, of the app, all right, because, um, again, with a smaller screen on a mobile device, that can be, can, can be a problem for some. Anything else? Well, again, not, not cluttered, sufficient white space between things, and so on. Anything else? Okay, very good. Um, designing navigation in a way that will simplify things. You, you said have a secondary menu so they don't have to go and, and mouse around, but that, that's a good one, designing your navigation in such a way to, to simplify that process. Did you have your hand up? And that's a good one. Again, um, make sure that your pages have the right amount of content on them. What's the right amount? You know, hey, that's why you get the big bucks. You have to decide and you have to figure out what is the right content, right amount of content for any particular thing. But too much content on a page is bad. Too little is bad. All right. If you, if there's such little content on each page that really you have to click a dozen links to get all the information that you want, then that's not good. If you have a page where you have to scroll through for hours to get what you want, that's not good either. So designing your page and structuring it when you do the structure diagram uh, to have the right amount of links and the right amount of content per page is important. That's, that's, a, that's a very good example. Um, again, and it extends the example beyond just thinking of Accessibility is like, okay, what colors are we going to use, whatever. It's applying some thought to your site before doing it and figuring out a way, again, that's going to accommodate people with disabilities and not. It doesn't matter if I have carpal tunnel or not. I don't want to click through a dozen different links. All right? It's going to be painful for me to do that. In the case of someone with carpal tunnel, it will literally be painful for them. All right? Uh, therefore, you want to avoid... Uh, doing that, you know, and, and have a well-designed, well-thought-out site. Other things that you can do. This is something a lot of people do, a lot of expert users do, and even though I've been using a computer forever, I still don't do that much. Allow for keyboard shortcuts. You know, if you look at people that, you know, a lot of savvy people, you know, they just, you know, they never take their hands off the keyboard. They're always hitting the keyboard shortcuts and all that. I'm definitely a mouser, all right? So I don't do that. But that being said, regardless of what your own personal style is, you can incorporate keyboard shortcuts for certain links into your page. And that can make things easier for people to have a hard time with the fine pointing. Is that something that you actually have to put? Yeah. Yeah, you have to code. We'll look at examples. It's the last couple minutes of class. We'll look at some of the references that are available online um, that will talk about that. OK. Yeah, there's some behavior. For example, you could tab through. You could tab through the links, backspace, and hit space to, to fire off a link. So yeah, some of that capability is built into the browser, but you can, you can enhance that. What about people with cognitive disabilities? ADD, dyslexia. Yes. Okay. Write it, write, write your content, have your content as, as simple as possible. Um, doesn't mean to dumb down your content. You know, if you are 
uh, writing content, you know, that, that already is of a high level, you know, you can still use as simple language as you can. I think Einstein said things should be made as simple as they can, but no simpler. So you want to stay true to your content, but there's all sorts of ways that you can, you can write uh, in a manner that, that is more readable. So your writing style, absolutely. Anything else? Different fonts, definitely. Um, the, um, I actually saw a font that was designed specifically for people with dyslexia because, um, like for example, the, the, the B and the D, lowercase b and D, uh, are, are perfectly symmetric. So it's easy for someone to do that. But in this font, they weren't symmetric. So it was easier to see the difference. And there's all kinds of things you can do, but pick a clear font. Some of those decorative fonts, you know, are just horrible to begin with. But, you know, if you need another reason not to use them, that would, that would be it. The other thing we mentioned is include images along with that to kind of give the person a tip. What about ADD? Yeah, don't, don't, don't get rid of uh, or get rid of clutter. Don't put additional things on the page that don't really add to the value. Again, it's not about dumbing down your content or taking content off your site. It's about choosing deliberately what you're going to put on the site and making sure the stuff that you put on your site really adds value. A bulleted list, very good. You know, you do tend to read different when you're on the web, even someone that doesn't have these particular disabilities. So uh, the ability to scan through something quickly is, is typically good. Um, avoid things that animate, you know, for triggering seizures and so on. Um, I'd like to point out some resources on Angel real quick that you can read through. I've seen some of those screen readers. You can you can choose a male voice, a female voice. You can give it a British accent if you'd rather. You can have fun with it. Oh really? My GPS always sounds like it's nagging me. Uh, I didn't say that. I said nothing of the sort. There's actually a whole folder on accessibility resources, and I just want to point out some things. Here's a PowerPoint that I uh, did, uh, that I created for a, a little session that I ran here with some uh, w with faculty. I don't, I don't like to give PowerPoint presentations, so I didn't give that one. Here's a good resource as we get into forms and tables to view. Here's a bit about access keys, um, if, if you're interested in that. Here is a case of Target being sued for an inaccessible website. What, regardless of the outcome, do you want to be, you know, you want your organization being sued? Some other uh, guidelines and all that. Um, here's an interesting one. Here is um, a colorblindness test. Actually, you know, colorblindness doesn't mean that you see things, you know, in black and white. Uh, there are different kinds of colorblindness depending on, on it, you know. What did you say? The blue-green one is is one, but there's other ones too. Yeah, yeah. Th there's other there's other ones that are uh, that come into play too. And this page, I won't click into it, but if you're interested, you can do it. You can actually load up a page and run it through sort of like a, a color blindness filter, and it will say someone that has this kind of color blindness. This is how they'll see your page. This is a good way to test things out. Any questions or further comments? All right, see you over in lab.